why it's so important to understand the why of things, right? Because, you know, there's been a lot of dogma, there's been a lot of tradition. And <clears throat> we look at someone like Arnold or someone like whoever you want to look at, Pierre Vandenstein, right? Someone who we know had fantastic abs and he did leg raises. And so you think, oh, well, if he has great abs, he did hanging leg raises, therefore this caused that. No, because number one, he didn't do just hanging leg raises. He certainly did crunches. And the hanging leg raises might not have contributed very much to the abdominal development, but they didn't take away from the benefit of the crunches, right? So you can still look good. The question isn't, can I look good if I do all of these exercises, even the bad ones? The question is, can I look good doing only the good ones? And the answer is absolutely yes. And you'd save a lot of time, save a lot of energy, save a lot of injury risk. I suppose uh, just because we're still talking about the hanging leg raises, it's a good chance to get into the resistance curve and why it's important to follow it correctly. So um, maybe the triceps kickback, uh, another good example. But when you're doing the hanging leg raises and you have to, people say, well, you're not doing it right. You have to lift your knees up too and you have to rotate your pelvis forward. That works the abs. And they'll use that argument. Uh, but that's, as you know, a little bit outside the resistance curve. So would you mind speaking on that? Um, look, first of all, <laughs> You, you know, as well as I do, there's so much nonsense out there. And it's um, at least amusing, if not worse than amusing. It's at least amusing to see Annoying. people. Yeah, I, let's just, uh, I'll just say amusing to see people who are absolutely positively convinced that the way they're telling you to do this thing is right. And so much so they have such an emotional investment in that message that if they were to realize if they were to allow themselves to realize the error of their ways, they'd have a really hard time now admitting that all that time they were being so confident they were wrong. Right? So let's just say that someone were to say, well, look, when you're doing a hanging leg raise, you've got to bring your tailbone under. And I would say, uh, okay, so what you're, telling us, you may not realize you're telling us this, but what you're doing is you're saying, I realize the abdominal muscle has to shorten. And that means that the origin and the insertion of that muscle need to get closer together in order for that to shorten. Now you can do that by bringing the origin toward the insertion or the insertion toward the origin. But if you were a muscle and you were connected on two ends and you're contracting, you actually don't know which end is moving. There's no way for you, you can't see the skeleton. All you know is that you're shortening and you're, the two ends are coming together. It could be this end is stable and you're going this way. Could be you're going this way. But at the end of the day, just like two guys doing a tug of war, it doesn't matter who's winning, the tension will be evenly distributed throughout. So the next question you have to, you'd have to ask is, is there an advantage to having the lower portion move toward the upper portion rather than vice versa? And the answer is no, there is no advantage. And the reason for that is very simple. Number one, you can't spot reduce. So I mean, most people I think know that, but you can't add ridges. You can't convert a four pack to a six pack or an eight pack. You what if I train it. my lower abs really hard? Well, that's what I'm saying is people think that <laughs> the reason why they're working the lower abs is so that they will get more notches. At the end of the day, that's what they're thinking. And those notches are called tendinous intersections. They're essentially tendons. They've been there since you were born. You'll never be able to add another tendinous intersection, just like you'll never be able to add another Achilles tendon. No matter how hard you train your calves, you'll never have another Achilles tendon. No matter if you train your calves upside down, You'll never have another Achilles tendon. Doesn't matter how you train him, facing north, south, east, west. Doesn't matter. You'll never have another Achilles tendon. Same thing with the abs. You will never, ever, ever change the appearance of your abs. All you can do is make that muscle get more developed, meaning that those ridges get higher, the valleys get deeper. You strip away the fat. You see what Mother Nature gave you. Period. That's all you can do. So no one would argue with the fact that leg raises are harder than crunches unnecessarily why would you do an exercise that requires hanging with your arms involving the hip flexors straining the lower back because of this push pull thing this lumbar pulling right when it's just as easy to do a regular standard either an incline crunch or a seated cable crunch or something 
You don't involve the arms. You don't involve the hip flexors. You don't involve the discomfort of the lower back. You get a better result. You know, it is just foolish to work harder with less payback. Well, not only that, but it's, I mean, obviously considerably easier and they all do it anyways, using the momentum of lifting their knees wildly and swinging their legs like lunatics to get them up there. You're not really contracting your abs at that point for more than a second anyways. I mean, there's no yeah, control. I, I, you know, the, 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 one of the biggest mistakes people make in fitness is, is, is thinking that the value of the exercise is determined either by the weight they're lifting or how much it burns or how much you're sweating. You, you've got to use better criteria than that. You've got to use better sense than that. I mean, it's subjective anyways. There's some people that can't even feel their muscles in pain. I mean, you know, so how are they going to judge that? <laughs> nor, where, nor where they're feeling it. <laughs> yeah, they're screwed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, can, can we move on to, um, this is a big one. And uh, I know you, you, you just explained the incline press and why the incline press isn't good. I put that on my channel. Uh, thank you again for doing that. And the squat, you were kind enough to explain that, but would you also just uh, get into the deadlift too for a moment? And uh, why that doesn't actually, it's not a hamstring exercise. It's, it's basically loads your back, even though people don't seem okay. to think it does. So, 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 so to be clear to the viewers, we're not talking about a Romanian deadlift. We're talking mm -hmm. about a stiff-legged deadlift, SLDL, um, that is typically used for the hamstrings. And so um, some of you may have seen the video that I did where I responded to Mike Isratel where he was saying that, you know, it's absurd to think that the deadlift, the straight leg the deadlift does not work the hamstrings. So what I explained basically is that all muscles work through a simple mechanism whereby muscles cross over to the other side of a joint. And when that muscle contracts, it bends or extends that joint that's in between the origin and the insertion. So um, when you're talking about a bicep or a tricep, let me grab that thing. talking about you know a, 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 let's say a joint that is moved by one muscle or more specifically one muscle tendon right so this is this is a, a bicep right this is a bicep upper arm lower arm elbow right this is the insertion right so when the muscle shortens so what i did during that demonstration is i added another hook right here and i added another hook right there and then i took a little rope and i clipped it onto there and i pulled closer to the to the joint and farther from the joint and what i said is the amount of leverage that a muscle has in the participation of its joint bending is determined by how close to the joint it is or how far from the joint it is okay so the reason i did that is because when we're talking about hip extension which is the primary thing that's happening during a stiff legged deadlift we realize that there's three muscles that are contributing to that action so what we want to do is find out how much contribution each muscle has in that movement. So there's three muscles, the gluteus maximus, the adductors, and the hamstrings that are involved. Now, the gluteus is the biggest muscle of the entire body. So certainly it is the, the biggest muscle of the hip extensors. It crosses the joint by a lot. Its origin is way above the, the hip joint and insertion is way below the hip joint. It's got a lot of leverage in addition to being a very big, heavy muscle, okay? The next one is the adductors. And if you look at the anatomy, you can see it's significantly smaller than the glutes. And although the insertion is low on the leg, the origin is barely even with the hip joint. It's not significantly above the hip joint. So it can't possibly have the same amount of leverage as the glutes do. And then you look at the hamstrings and the hamstrings are the, is the smallest of the three muscles. They weigh the least, they are the smallest by volume. The insertion is low, obviously on the other side of the knee, but the origin is literally below the knee joint. I mean, the hip joint. So what I said in that video was, if you were in an engineering class and your assignment was to create a mechanism that would move that particular joint and you handed that in, the professor might even laugh at you. He'd say, well, you know, the rule number one is it has to be on the other side of the joint. This one isn't even on the other side of the joint. It's on the same side of the joint as the insertion, right? So although it could participate to some degree when the pelvis tilts, it is the mechanism that has the least good leverage and also the smallest muscle. 
So if you were to say, okay, well, you've got three muscles, they're all contributing, let's figure out the approximate percentages. The gluteus has to participate at the very least 70% of the force. It's probably much higher. It's probably 80 to 85% of the force. But just for the sake of argument, let's just say 70%. That leaves 30% to be shared by the adductors and the hamstrings. They don't evenly contribute, but even if they did, 15 for one and 15. So at, at the highest possible contribution, 15% is the amount of participation you'd get from the hamstring in hip extension. You're gonna do an exercise for the hamstring, even though it's only participating 15%. More realistically, it's only participating five to 8% of the hip extension force. And if you do a seated leg curl, it's 100% participation of the hamstring. They don't even compare, it's not even close. So someone says, well, yeah, but there's an EMG analysis that shows high activation. Well, high activation does not measure growth potential, early phase loading, range of motion, any of that stuff, right? So what it's doing is it's, it's measuring the amount of loaded stretch. Yes, you're getting a loaded stretch. And if you think that's good, if you think that's all a muscle needs for growth, then you should also be doing that for every other muscle. There isn't a single other exercise for the pecs, for the lats, for the bicep, triceps, quadriceps. There is no other exercise, no other muscle that we work only with a loaded stretch. I'm not saying stretch is bad or unnecessary. If you were to do a seated leg curl and you pull yourself forward, you get the stretch too, as well as the knee flexion, right? So there's just no way, logically speaking, that you can look at that exercise knowing the bad mechanics, hip extension mechanics of the hamstrings and think it's a good exercise. There's just no way, right? This is, I call this intellectually lazy. You're not pulling back the curtain. You're the rabbit, the rabbit disappeared and you figured, oh, well, I guess it did. It's like, no, there are mechanical rules. There are mechanical principles. You've got to be able to say that's impossible. Something else is, is going on here. It's not as it appears.